Most of life's great beginnings are humble. They are so understated and remote, you barely have a hint they even happened. And so it is with the time when Texas became Texas, especially the Texas you know today. Not the old Spanish province or the northern Mexican state that was politically connected to Coahuila, but something very different. Something that deserved to stand apart from everything else, like a lone star on a clear night. It is here, on this very remote and unlikely site we now know as Washington on the Brazos, where the birth of a bold and courageous idea took form and became an independent republic. What if you could go back to when the Republic of Texas was born? As 21st century time travelers, what would you experience differently by actually being there when it happened? Here a nation was born. And how would it change everything you think you know? What eventually takes place here is not planned. It is born of political and military chaos during the most dramatic moments in Texas history. Here's how it happened. As with all conflicts, opposing sides shared different ideas and perspectives on how the other was at fault. After granting Americans the opportunity to settle in Texas, Mexico is alarmed by the flood of immigrants to the territory, their reluctance to accept Catholicism and their continued unlawful practice of owning slaves. Of course, the new Texians see it differently. They feel that their political representation with Mexico City is meaningless. They see the rise of an oppressive military dictatorship under President Antonio Lopez de Santa Anna and resent the demise of the Mexican Constitution of 1824. The breaking point for many Texians is the one-year imprisonment of their leader, Stephen F. Austin, who makes a simple request for Mexican statehood. When he returns from prison in 1835, the momentum towards revolution accelerates. By October, there is no turning back, as the opening shots at Gonzales now drive both sides into a bloody conflict. And so it quickly begins. Texian forces swarm on both Goliad and Bejar. Presidio La Bahia is quickly taken, while 95 miles to the northwest, another aggressive Texian force steadily moves in on the old Spanish center of Bejar. Although outnumbered three to one, the Texians send the panicked Mexican troops retreating across the Rio Grande River. Despite these early successes, the future of Texas is cloudy and uncertain. In early November, prominent men assemble at San Felipe de Austin to discuss the way forward. However, many of their strongest leaders are in the field of battle. There's a divide between those who seek reconciliation with Mexico and those who are determined to create an independent nation. Even though they disband in frustration, the embers of independence are ignited the San Felipe Consultation calls for a convention to be held on March 1, 1836, where elected representatives from towns and municipalities will meet to determine the fate of Texas. Even patriotic delegates like Dr. Branch T. Archer sense that the flame will finally catch and set fire to the hopes for Texas independence. The early Texian victories at Gonzales, Goliad, and Bejar were not decisive, however. The rebellion suffers from a severe lack of organized strategy and too many bang-glorious commanders who lack leadership and military experience. These opportunists whittle away precious supplies just as volunteer enlistments begin expiring. Add political infighting to the mix, and the Texians are about to face the perfect storm. Unbeknownst to many, General Santa Ana and thousands of professional soldiers are now marching to Texas to crush the rebellion. His first target for revenge, 
San Antonio de Bejar and its nearby fortified mission, the Alamo. The two opposing sides step up the pace for the future control of Texas. Everyone is keenly aware that the risks are high, especially for the disorganized and ill-equipped Texians. Some think the ultimate battle will take place in the old Spanish towns of Bejar or Goliad, but fate will soon reveal new locations, only recently plotted and mapped, will hold the key to Texas independence. One of the most unassuming hovels of existence for such a role is the crude and muddy town of Washington. Situated on the Brazos River on the La Bahia Road, a branch of El Camino Real, a well-known ferry crossing is the lifeline for the two dozen or so cabins and stark shelters of the town. It is not the most comfortable place to be, especially this winter of 1835-36. Frigid northers have routinely cut through Texas, followed by deluges of cold rain showers, making the travel coming to and through Washington more than challenging. Colonel William Fairfax Gray describes the scene. It is laid out in the woods. About a dozen wretched cabins and shanties constitute the city. Not one decent house in it, and only one well-defined street, which consists of an opening cut out in the woods. The stumps still standing. A rare place to hold a national convention in. Despite the lack of comforts, Washington becomes the temporary destination for Texas volunteers like David Crockett, who stays here for two nights before heading into certain danger at the Alamo. Washington, 23rd January, 1836. This is to certify that John Lott furnished myself and four of the volunteers on our way to the Army with accommodations for ourselves and ample horses. The government will pay him $7.50. David Crockett. But Crockett isn't the first to hear of Washington as a potential hub for political and economic ambitions. The young but growing town displays a sense of confidence about the future. To convince the delegates to hold their convention in Washington, the town citizens offer a free meeting space in an unfinished building along the main street. Washington is chosen as the convention location, and delegates begin to arrive in town as the tide of war turns against the Texians. About the same time that Santa Ana's advanced forces surprised Travis and the unsuspecting garrison at Bejar, Texian delegates and patriots, feeling a sense of urgency, begin flowing into Washington. They arrive about the time Lieutenant Colonel William Barrett Travis is writing his famous victory or death letter from the Alamo, as General Santa Ana besieges him and his tiny garrison from all sides. What if you could be there? What would it be like to go back to 1836 and follow the path of Travis's courier from the Alamo and witness the delivery of one of the most important documents in American history to the delegation at Washington? How would it feel to see how these famous historic events unfold right in front of you? Your journey to Washington begins here and now. Albert, take this to Gonzalez, San Felipe, and then on to Washington. Nobody outside these walls knows that Santa Ana's here. The convention needs to know that we are facing victory or death. Yes, sir. We need men and supplies post haste. Now go! Yeah. Yes, sir. It's approximately 180 miles from the Alamo to Washington. How difficult would it be to travel rugged country in bad weather? And how would you know your way? Could you read the land? And how would you get your food and water? It's a much different world from the one you live today, and it will take you four days to get there. Somehow on your historic route, the energy of the past overtakes you. The historic moment is now just before you. The news that the Mexican army has a death grip on Travis's small garrison gives a foreboding feeling 
that the course of war has shifted against the Texians. When the young Alamo commander's words are read to the delegation's first arrivals, the task at hand is very clear. Imagine being in that modest room to witness the delegates' determined resolve against overwhelming odds. I am determined to sustain myself as long as possible and die like a soldier who never forgets what is due to his own honor and to that of his country. Victory or death. Unlike the stalemate experienced at San Felipe four months earlier, this elected delegation of 59 men arrives with strong intentions of changing the course of history. Some of these dedicated Texians are descendants of American revolutionaries who three generations earlier signed the Declaration of Independence in 1776. They come into Washington with the spirit of independence flowing in their veins. A diverse collection of men, they're from places such as North Carolina, Tennessee, New Jersey, Canada, the Yucatan, and Tejas. They're farmers, merchants, doctors, and lawyers, and they're young. 40 of the 59 are under 40 years of age. Despite their personal differences, they know that there is no time to lose. Now that you're here in Washington, what individuals would you notice as key contributors to the Texian cause? One might be George Childress, originally from Tennessee. You see that he's well prepared with a stack of papers, books, and other writing material. There are others, including Lorenzo de Zavala, considered one of the most impressive and accomplished men in Texas. There's also Thomas Rusk, Samuel Carson, and Jose Antonio Navarro, among other notable delegates who are present. By February 28th, the most famous participating delegate is now here. Colonel Gray writes about the impact made by General Sam Houston. General Houston's arrival has created more sensation than that of any other man. He is evidently the people's man. He seems to take pains to ingratiate himself with everybody. He's much broken in appearance, but still has a fine persona and courtly manners. Be 43 years old on the 3rd of March. Looks older. However, the setting in Washington is not the most comfortable to execute this important business. The first day of the convention is met with an unrelenting norther that unleashes lightning, thunder, rain, and hail. Colonel Gray is recording a journal of this historic gathering. In the morning, the thermometer was down to 33 degrees, and everybody was shivering and exclaiming against the cold. This is the second regular norther that I have experienced. Despite the cold, the members of the convention meet today in an unfinished house. There are no glass window panes, so cotton cloth is stretched across the frames in an attempt to block the cold wind, but allow light. The delegation quickly huddles in their primitive structure as George Childress calls the convention to order. First major line of business, organize a committee to prepare a Declaration of Independence. Four others join Childress to create the first draft of the Declaration. It will not come easily as delegates begin to engage in political quarrels, which are quickly put to rest. Gentlemen, 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 we must have order. I'm calling this convention to order. As the delegation adjourns for the day, Childress and his committee take on the burden of having something to present to their fellow statesmen by morning. A clear and chilly morning welcomes what will be the most historic day in Texas history. George Childress and his committee worked for hours by dim candlelight, finishing their task before dawn. Largely influenced by the writings of Thomas Jefferson and his work on the American Declaration, the Texians lay their guide stones. Colonel Gray records the results. Mr. Childress from the committee reported a Declaration of Independence which he read in its place. It was received by the House, committed by the Committee of the Whole, reported without amendment and unanimously adopted in less than one hour from its first and only reading. It underwent no discussion and no attempt was made to amend it. One hour, that's all it took. By unanimous agreement, the Texas Declaration of Independence is poised to be the formative document to share with the world. 
One problem exists. It's not ready for printing. Riddled with grammatical errors and poor handwriting, there's a lot of cleaning up to do before it can be presented to an international stage. Once again, Colonel Gray sees what must be done. A copy of the declaration having been made in a fair hand, an attempt was made to read it, preparatory to signing. But it was found so full of errors that it was recommitted to the committee that reported it for correction and engrossment. The conventionists hasten to finish their business as another express from the Alamo arrives, detailing Santa Ana's first unsuccessful assault on the old mission. So far, the little garrison is holding out against overwhelming odds. At this point, the men inside the Alamo have no idea that their gallant stand is finally supported by a declaration of independence. Although a major milestone has been reached, the delegates all know that there is much more work to be done before they can help their friends on the battlefield. Time, however, is not on their side. Once again, the declaration is read and signed by all members present in an atmosphere of harmony that will get the new republic moving forward. Over the next few days, the delegates move methodically through their agenda. Sam Houston is appointed commander-in-chief, while committees on important issues such as finance, the army, and militia are appointed. But three days later, business comes to a halt. There's a morning rush into the small convention room with the announcement that two letters from the Alamo have just arrived. Both letters update the dire situation Travis and his men are facing, but the second letter is to Jesse Grimes, whose son is one of the brave defenders facing certain death. Other delegates also have kin inside those mission walls. The reading of Travis's words has a feeling of despair. What no one in that little room knows for nine more days is that the entire Alamo garrison has already fallen that very morning. Let the convention go on and make a declaration of independence. And we will then understand, and the world will understand, what we are fighting for. If independence is not declared, I shall lay down my arms, and so will the men under my command. But under the flag of independence, we are ready to peril our lives a hundred times a day, and to drive away the monster who is fighting us under a blood-red flag, threatening to murder our prisoners, and make Texas a waste desert. The outspoken General Sam Houston has this to say about the Texians if a legitimate government is not created. They will be nothing but outlaws and will have neither the sympathy nor respect of mankind. Houston and his staff now depart Washington to organize an army to save the Alamo. It's been three days since General Houston left for Gonzales to raise an army. There's been no word from the Alamo. Meanwhile, Delegate Palmer, chairman of the committee to draft a constitution, makes a report on the progress and presents a draft. Influenced by the writings of the 1824 Constitution of Mexico, Spanish law, the United States Constitution, and the Magna Carta, they're attempting to create a guide for the new Texian government. We, the people of Texas, in order to form a government, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense and general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this constitution for the Republic of Texas. The business of the convention drags, and there are some questions that they seem afraid to approach. The land question is one, and the loan they are unwilling or afraid to ratify. Such miserable, narrow-mindedness is astonishing. There's a great want of political philosophy and practical political knowledge in the body. Emotional stress amongst the delegates is increasing each day for two main reasons. One is the complex work to complete the Constitution as political ambitions are getting in the way, and second, 
there is still no word from the Alamo. The business of the Constitution moves slowly. Constitution is on the tapas every day. It is a good one on the whole, but clumsily put together, indifferent in arrangement and worse in grammar. No news yet from the Alamo. Much anxiety is being felt for the fate of the brave men there. It is obvious that they must be surrounded and all communication with them cut off. Each day is now the same. Tremendous efforts are being made to create the Constitution and yet nothing from the Alamo. Many are feeling a sense of doom as Gray writes in his journal. No intelligence yet from the Alamo. The anxiety begins to be intense. Mr. Badgett, Dr. Goodrich, members of the convention have brothers there. And Mr. Grimes, another member, has a son there. A militia battalion from Nacogdoches arrives and is addressed with patriotic cheer by the delegation. But by mid-afternoon, everything changes. It fell, boys. No quarter. They're all dead. An express was received from General Houston, bringing the sad intelligence of the fall of the Alamo on the morning of the 6th. His letters were dated on the 11th and the 13th. And a letter from Juan Seguin and Gonzalez to Ruaz and Navarro about the same account. Still, some did, or affected to disbelieve it. After learning of the loss of his brother at the Alamo, Delegate Benjamin Goodrich writes a letter to his family. The blood of a Goodrich has already crimsoned the soil of Texas, and another victim shall be added to the list, or I will see Texas free and independent. In the early morning hours, another express rider arrives from Gonzales, confirming that the fall of the Alamo is real. Fear of the Mexican army grips the community, including the delegation. Some of the members frantically gather their belongings to head home to protect their families and property. Across Texas, others are fleeing their homes for the North, terrified of the long arm of Santa Ana and his lethal force, leaving all but their most valuable possessions. This would become known as the runaway scrape. The remaining delegates rush to finish the tedious business of the Constitution and try to come up with an answer to how the war will be funded. By now, Gray and others are completely disgusted by convention president Richard Ellis and some of the members for being selfish and close-minded at this critical hour. The proceedings of the House tonight were disorderly in the extreme and boyish. Nearly all the members were sometimes on the floor at once, some calling questions, some laughing and clapping, etc. The president, by his manifest partiality, egotism, and alarm, has lost the respect of the House. The convention made up for its lack of progress by working late into the evening and adopting the hard-fought-for Constitution. As the sun rises, there is now a sense of overwhelming gloom and humility for what has taken place these last 17 days. Somehow, there is enough of a quorum to elect the new leaders of this infant republic. These men will lead the Republic of Texas through the remainder of the revolution and in the first days of independence. William Gray's last entries reveal the heartfelt dismay and fear that penetrated Washington as it instantly becomes a ghost town. The members are now dispersing in all directions with haste and in confusion. A general panic seems to have seized them. Their families are exposed and defenseless, and hundreds are moving off to the east. A constant stream of women and children, and some men with wagons, carts, and pack mules, all rushing across the Brazos night and day. The families of this place and storekeepers are packing up and moving. The awful cry has been heard from the midst of their assembly. What shall we do to be saved? Mm -hmm. 
No one can imagine what the future holds for Texas at this fateful and critical time. But in just 31 days, their dramatic journey for independence will travel into the deepest and darkest despairs one could imagine. The Goliad Massacre and the civilian exodus out of harm's way known as the Runaway Scrape. Even General Houston's army will retreat to the east, waiting for that one last chance to strike back when all hope has faded. And just as the darkest hours seem endless, the Lone Star, which rose on March 2nd, shines its light on the plains of San Jacinto with the battle cry, Remember the Alamo! Remember Goliad! The unlikely victory over Santa Ana's forces would have been irrelevant if not for the men that put Texas to paper, proving that not all battles are fought with a sword. Many are fought with the pen. History was made during those 17 days in this modest setting we now know as Washington on the Brazos. Now that the story of independence has unfolded before you, think of how your life is intertwined with the revolutionary Texians. How will you share our history with future Texians? How will you honor the legacy? What will you remember? <laughs>